Right. Take it away, Melissa. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for having me and for helping me with my research. Um, I was really grateful for all the help that I got from the librarian at Scripps and people who were happy to talk to me about this topic. Um, so my name is Melissa Miller. I wrote an article called, uh, you know, A Line in the Sand, uh, Women's History of Scripps Institution of Oceanography. It was actually for a science writing class that I took through UCSD Extension last quarter, and I definitely recommend that class uh, to anyone who's interested. It's it's wide open. Um, and, you know, we were given this uh, information to just go ahead and, and choose a topic and really dive deep into it. And I feel passionate about it and it was a really fun thing to do. The Scripps Photo Archives are a good time. If you don't have more than five minutes, I would say don't check them out because you will inevitably get stuck uh, in a rabbit hole for a while. Um, this first slide has a 1927 uh, panoramic from the Scripps Pier, and I just want to share a little bit about the history that's in that article. I need to make some updates to that article, actually, because the um, references and the sources, a lot of them got reorganized, so the, the links don't work, but I'm going to work on getting that done hopefully in the next week. Um, but so I want to tell you a little bit about the women's history that I found out, but also a little bit about what it was like to do that research and how, you know, there's still a lot of uh, potentially inaccuracies and, and inconsistencies because it's hard to do research about women's history at Scripps. Um, so just briefly about me, I'm a technician or I was a technician at Scripps from 2009 till earlier this year. I spent over a thousand days at sea for Scripps projects. There's my little map of all the different cruises I went on, including a whole bunch around coastal California with the Cal Coffee program and also with the Sally Ride. Um, when it was brand new ship, I spent most of the first year on science verification cruises, um, working on outreach projects. So I was mostly a chemist in, the, in a lab, but also um, getting to do a bunch of blog posts and social media for the Sally Ride for, for that time. I first got interested in this topic specifically after uh, reading this article, my husband uh, pointed me to in National Geographic, the March 2020 National Geographic. It was the beginning of a year highlighting women trailblazers, current, past, you know, all throughout National Geographic's history. And it started with just a couple simple paragraphs at the beginning about National Geographic's own role in hiding, you know, female scientists and uh, females who were working on these projects, uh, you know, giving credit to their husbands or only asking them to write about what it was like to keep house in the field as opposed to what it was like to do the research itself. Uh, and I just thought that was really important for National Geographic to not get called out, but to, to put it there in writing with examples about, you know, their, their own uh, problematic past role in this. And, you know, it's something with the Me Too movement, I've really been feeling like there's a reckoning coming for academia, for, you know, research vessels, those sorts of things potentially. And I just, you know, I, I would love for to see, you know, institutions get out ahead of those things. And there's obviously that some of that um, at Scripps. And so I wanted to be part of, of sharing that history. Um, the movie picture of scientists if people have seen that was also a really great way to sort of speak up about the harassment and that toxic mas masculinity that affects us all uh, in the workplace so definitely something that needs to be dismantled um, institutions have to get involved and acknowledge it um, and pull those hidden figures you know out of obscurity and remember that women were always here at Scripps uh, so a couple of slides about the women that I found in in some of this research and the, the first one the sort of like top of the one easy to find was Laura Hubbs. She worked at Scripps for 35 years and never made a cent was never paid. Uh, nepotism rules in place at the time uh, didn't allow relatives to both be paid. And so her husband Carl had the lab had uh, you know the career the grad students the funding. Um, and Laura Hubbs was essentially a volunteer on, on his research projects, but she was a co-author on research papers. She went on expeditions. She helped found the collections at Scripps, which are, you know, these world famous collections now. Um, ben Frabel, who I talked to a little bit for this, said she had terrible handwriting. He still sees the little cards from her uh, in the collections. Um, but 
you know, it just it was it was shocking to me to find out in five minutes of research that she worked for decades and never made any money. Um, and then Hubs Hall, of course, um, we only refer to it as Hubs Hall, not Carl Hubs Hall, but it is named specifically only after Carl Hubs. Uh, it is not Carl and Laura Hubs Hall uh, on the official records. I have a little movie here, a little clip uh, from a, a movie that actually came to my attention when Rob Monroe was doing his own book tour. This just sort of like a fun little um, couple of minutes. Errol Flynn came to scripts and did some uh, research cruises. And so there's just a, some little insights from the 1940s. So I'm going to play that real quick. You hear that OK? No. trip down to La Jolla gave me a seagull's eye view of the California coastline. Some very good friends of mine were expecting me. These friends were marine scientists connected with the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. I can see them on the lawn below waiting for us to land. I knew they'd kid me about needing a haircut, but I had to let it grow for my next picture. Well, there was Carl, looking as if he'd just come out of his laboratory. To be exact, Dr. Carl L. Hubbs, professor of biology, other members of the staff, and of course, Laura, that's Mrs. Hubbs, just as keen a scientist as her famous husband. The Scripps Institution of Oceanography, which has been operating at La Jolla since 1910, is a branch of the University of California, and its general purpose is to study all and every phase of the scientific life of the ocean. To one like myself, the work being carried on at the institution bore a continuing fascination. And I was no stranger to the institution's dog either, because I'd pulled ashore here many times from my schooner, the Zaka. Well, Carl said that he had an idea and he wanted to talk it over with me. But Laura, up on the observation roof, saw something that put a quick stop to any further discussion. Just offshore, a gray whale and a big one. Excitedly, she sent the word over the walkie-talkie. But we'd already seen the creatures, for there were more than one. All right, I just love that little insight into scripts in the 1940s and, and really enjoy that one liner of Laura, you know, just as keen a scientist as her husband. Um, so there's lots of good stuff like that uh, in the historical records that, that are always fun. Um, so brief brief overview of some of the research I found in terms of, you know, the women at Scripps and, and being the trailblazers. Um, the first graduate degree ever awarded by what was then called the Marine Biological Association went to a woman, Edna Watson. Um, she got her master's and PhD um, in zoology. Um, Easter Ellen Cup then went on to get the first um, PhD in oceanography, which at the time was a relatively new field. Um, and this was sort of fun information to come across. I find found information about um, Dr. Cup relatively easily, um, including that she was a postdoc then at Scripps for a few years uh, until she was discouraged from continuing her career um, by the director at the time, Harold Spairdrup, um, and instead became a school teacher. And it would be more than 40 years or nearly 40 years uh, before a female faculty member uh, was actually hired at Scripps. But both of these um, years were decades ahead of other institutions in terms of granting PhDs um, to women. The very first black student at Scripps was a woman. Uh, this is not a picture of Anita B. Smith in 1945, but it was the only picture I could find of her. Um, she later went on to found the Marine Biology Program at Hampton University um, and has a scholarship named after her there. Uh, there's some conflicting records as to whether or not it was 1945 or 1950. Um, again, I'll show you a little bit about what those records look like so you can understand why there's there's potential for conflicts there. Um, and then Helen Hill Rate uh, was the first to, to go out on a long research cruise for Scripps. Uh, and this is especially significant because it came in the time window where the director at the time, Carl Eckert, had instituted a rule in 1949 that no women were allowed to go on overnight cruises. And that even for uh, day cruises, they had to get special permission. And this was for safety reasons, uh, whatever that means. <laughs> and uh, but women who had the patronage, um, sometimes of their husbands or their advisors, could get permission and still got to go to sea. Um, um, Rate was actually the wife of a professor who was on this same cruise. 
Um, Roger Ravel and Walter Monk were both also on this cruise. Um, and she wrote the, the script's 50 first, first 50 years um, history book. And I like to think that's what she's doing here on the deck of, of the research uh, vessel, but I don't actually know that for sure. It just reminds me of when I go to sea and I'm always saying I'm gonna work on my side projects and I never get anything done. Um, but uh, so that rule about women at sea was struck down in 1960 when Scripps became officially part of University of California, San Diego and the non-discrimination rules um, took effect. And that was also, so that paved the way for these two women, Tanya Atwater, five years after that rule was struck down was the first woman to be granted ship time. She later was uh, chief scientist of an all female cruise research, at least the science party was all female in 1968. Um, it's note noteworthy that this was during, you know, the Vietnam War and a lot of male students were not uh, working at Scripps at the time. She was then later hired as faculty, but then continued her career at MIT and UC Santa Barbara. Uh, also, that non-discrimination rule uh, led to women being hired on the crew for the first time in 1968 it was Louise Henry, and she worked as a Scripps crew member for more than 20 years. And some of that you know, still being the female female crew members are still, you know, rare, relatively rare um, for all of those of us who have been on sea. There is definitely women throughout the ranks. There's chief mate right now at Scripps. There's a bosun at Scripps who are women, um, but there still is yet to be a female captain or a female chief engineer um, at Scripps. And, and part of that is that Cal Maritime, um, the academy only admitted women for the first time in 1973, and even now, is still their their graduation rate is under 20% women. So there is, you know, some issues there in the in the leading up to that. First woman to get tenure at Scripps is Mary was Miriam Kastner in 1977. She was also hired the same year as Tanya Atwater in 1972. Uh, and then Margaret Leinen, of course, is uh, our director now and became the first female director in 2013. Um, Kathy Constable was the interim director right before that. This uh, obviously is not a picture of Margaret from 2013. It's from 1983. And I found it when I was doing all my research in the archives and just thought it was too funny uh, not to share. So my personally, my second ever research cruise was with uh, Dr. Kastner as chief scientist. And we were in the Gulf of Mexico on something that wasn't a research vessel. I think usually it was used as an oil exploration platform. And so the crew was definitely a little bit different than in the academic fleet. And the ROV pilot, who is a man, didn't actually want women working on the deck, didn't want women deploying and recovering his ROV. But, but eventually he had to relent because there literally weren't enough men in the science party to do this work at all hours of the day. Um, so he got overruled pretty quickly, but this was in 2009 and, you know, shocked me a little bit, having lived in California most of my life, um, that this sort of attitude still prevails. Uh, I'd love to talk to uh, Miriam about it now because she'd probably been dealing with it, you know, for 50 years at the time, but to me it was pretty shocking. Um, Margaret was really kind enough to chat with me when I was writing the piece and a little bit of follow up since. Um, she also has stories of harassment at sea when she was, you know, a graduate student. Uh, there was a ship's bosun that told her and, and her fellow female graduate student that they were a distraction. Someone was going to get hurt if they came out to work on the fantail, so they weren't allowed to go past a certain point. And, you know, it's notable that that other grad student is Kathy Sullivan, who later became a NASA astronaut and went to space. So the bosun apparently did apologize to, to Margaret years later, but you know, the point is that it shouldn't, you shouldn't go have to go on to be director of scripts or go to space in order to get an apology, um, you know, or to, in order to be treated, you know, fairly in the workplace. Uh, it should be something that's just available to all women, all people. Um, I also spoke to Professor Lynn Talley, who started on the faculty in 1984, and she said she didn't think much of it at the time when, when Margaret became director, you know, it didn't really matter. Um, the gender of the director, but she says she's really very quickly was able to see that it does make a difference. Um, the students at Scripps had been 50-50 gender balanced since the 90s, but that the faculty level stayed under 20% that whole time. So a couple of stat slides here, not too many, hopefully, um, but just about this assumption of fairness, right? If there's 50-50 grad students, the assumption is then there will be 50-50 people hired 
you know, as assistant professors and they'll move their way up to full professorship, but that's just not how it works. This rising tide doesn't lift all boats in this situation. You have to make conscious choices. And that's something that with Dr. Leinen as director, she's really overseen that the majority of the hiring that's been done since she came on board has been at the assistant professorship level. So there are more women um, in those levels. And of the 40 faculty members that have been hired since she started, 29 of, women, 29 of those are women. Um, one is black, two are indigenous, and three are Latina. Uh, and you can see here at the assistant professor level uh, in the last few years, it's a relatively 50-50 mix. Um, and it, you know, for now, it's just a promise that that will move up you know, throughout the ranks. Um, but that, that still takes effort, and it takes programs to retain those women. The on the main campus, this trend is is holding holding there as well. Um, those same script statistics are at the bottom of this chart. Um, so you can see that in the full professorship levels on main campus and the health sciences, uh, women are outnumbered almost four to one. But at the assistant professorship level, it's much closer to 50-50. Um, you know, I like that these stats were easy to find. There's a link at the bottom there, um, all sorts of dashboards and things like that. You can um, change around to, to get these stats. Graduate student stats are a little bit more confusing. Um, I'll go through a little bit about how I found out some of those. Um, that same site has information on graduate students. There's also uh, breakdowns by ethnicity and um, you can configure it to cover intersectionality. Um, there's also more options in the last few years than the binary male, male female. So the plots have more colors on them. Um, this one is for all of campus, not just separated out by scripts. Um, but this is also admission data. This isn't retention data. This isn't degrees awarded. And those are certainly different numbers. Based on a conversation I had with uh, Alyssa Griffin, who's a recent PhD, um, a woman of color at Scripps, you know, in her class, more women than men dropped out over the years. And she said she often, you know, questioned whether or not that meant something, whether or not, you know, she'd be happier if she left as well. And, you know, it's really something that there's programs in place to, to encourage people to stay, to help people stay and to, to work with them, um, their advisors. You know, it's just, sort of a fact that the factors that lead to drop out more, more affect women more. Um, family obligations, uh, conflicts with advisors or with other students, um, that power dynamic, um, and how you're really dependent on the men mem mentorship from the faculty member that you work with, and how the time you spend on other programs is sort of up to them and not really mandated or dictated or or um, anything like that. Um, and you might not think of those things when you're choosing what lab to go to. Um, there's also studies that the pandemic is unevenly affecting women's careers. Um, UCSD and Scripps are automatically giving people an extra year to for graduate students to qualify and for faculty to qualify for tenure. Um, you don't have to request it. And I think that that's very key is that you don't have to request it. It's just given. So that's the recent few years data is easy to come by. After that, you just have to do a little digging. I had to do a little digging in order to find out. I wanted to verify, you know, Lynn Talley's memory that the 90s were when the graduate students became 50-50. Um, but for the past 15 years, the data is these PDFs that are linked uh, on UCSD's website. Uh, there's one per quarter. So there's 45 of these to look through that show you, you know, the, the balance of men and women. Um, so there's a lot of things to open, a lot of things to check. There's still also not retention statistics. These are just admissions data. Before 2003, it's literally class photos that you have to go to uh, in order to determine the gender balance. Um, so this is how I did find out that in the 90s, um, the gender balance did, did hover right around 50% for the first time. And then before that, uh, you know, before the 60s, uh, it was a lot of these type write, typewritten notes, just sort of, um, you know, someone at a, at a time put a compilation together. Sometimes they conflict. One written in the 1930s says something different from one written in the 1960s. Um, so there's a little bit of guessing going on. Uh, and sometimes the names, the first names are just in initials. So that's not really an easy way to narrow things down. Um, I noteworthy on this one list, I, you know, is that the degrees 
um, at Scripps were originally instituted by uh, UC Berkeley and then switched to UCLA uh, and then eventually to UCSD. Um, this list on the right here shows Easter Ellen Cup as a postdoc at Scripps after she graduated. Um, but I also found it noteworthy that there's a woman up here at the top whose uh, profession was listed as married. So not something I saw on any of the men's lists. I wanna switch over to talking more about the research fleet itself. Um, the ships have mostly been named after men, many of which are naval heroes. So that just sort of tracks. Um, but I did find that there's the Ellen B. Scripps research vessel in the 1960s and 70s. Um, and then also this photo of a sailboat in the 1920s on the Scripps Pier called Ellen Browning. Um, the pier itself is named Ellen B. Scripps Pier, the one that uh, you know replaced the old one in 1988. Uh, and I, you know, I just I think that the naming of of ships is really important. I know when I go on a research cruise, I do a little Wikipedia search at least of you know who the person, who the namesake for the ship is, and I have family and friends who ask about it. Um, and you know, it's really an honor to be to have something like that named after you. Um, obviously, now at Scripps, we have the Sally Ride, which is a very big deal. Um, the first in the Unals fleet to be named after a woman. Uh, and I also just think it's very fitting since she was a UCSD faculty member. Um, and also that, you know, as the first American woman in space, the may all male, you know, NASA prep team tried to send her with a makeup kit and a uh, hundred tampons for her week in space. So just sort of proving that, you know, they had no idea what was going on. Um, she also came out in her obituary. So, you know, she was uh, a gay woman who achieved a lot. And uh, I think we are all, we should all be really proud to have that ship named after her here. Um, there's also the RV Carson um, that was, that joined the UNOS fleet just after the Sally ride. As for life on board the ships, uh, I spoke with uh, Lynn Talley, who in 1985, along with another group of women, put together the seagoing manual. And it outlined for the first time sexual harassment, the definitions, how to deal with it, how to report it, um, you know, and, and that it basically outlining how it shouldn't be, had no place in the work workplace. Um, and, and she had the support of the director of Scripps at the time and ships, ship operations. Uh, and they got mandatory training instituted for the first time. She also told me she was part of the sexual harassment claims process that the campus instituted after this. Um, and she remembers many of those cases being from the ships and also from the medical school at UCSD. And I've definitely seen positive change in terms of response in my career at Scripps. Um, I've been there since 2009. Um, so change in the response, if not necessarily the environment. Um, when I first started, I was signing paperwork with the HR person who was a female. And she told me something like, oh, the levels of harassment at sea are different. So you'll just have to you know, get used to that and accept it. And I certainly hope that no one in the year 2021 is being told that as they sign their, their, their paperwork to join Scripps. Um, but, you know, changes to the rules are one things, and then there's change to the culture that needs to be, needs to follow as well. Um, I found that harassment of all forms is being handled much more different, much more explicitly, um, from the trainings to the environment on board, people are talking about it more, um, people are talking about different levels of harassment. I was pleased in my most, uh, recent cruise to get training about just abusive behavior in general. Um, and, you know, I think we still have a ways to go. We need to make sure that that language and those trainings cover non-binary and trans folks that come on board our cruises as well. Um, I certainly noticed, I'm 38, and uh, so I started at Scripps when I was 27, and I did notice that once I sort of aged out of that average graduate student age, I became a confidant. Every single cruise I've been on in the last five years or so, uh, some younger woman has come to me to guide her through a harassment issue of some level. Um, there are frameworks for how to report it and who to talk to, but sometimes, if not almost all the time, everyone in that chain is a man. And so, you know, people would come to me just usually wanting validation that they should push back, you know, rather than to report it and escalate things further. 
um, and so that they could just sort of handle things on their own or wanting something someone to sort of complain to. Um, the last cruise I went on, the captain, who's you know a friend, knew this about me and about sort of how, how my role had changed and checked in with me every week or so um, to make sure there wasn't anything he should be aware of, you know, asking me explicitly, like, are you hearing anything? Is there someone I need to have a conversation with? And I just really appreciated that active check on his part rather than someone being like, oh, la la, or I never heard anything or, you know, anything like that. So I found that um, uh, encouraging progress. Uh, Lynn told me when I talked to her that the big change she saw was when the next generation of captains uh, took over. So people who had come up on the research vessels where women had always been around rather than people uh, who transferred over maybe from like the Navy. All right, back to some fun historical photos. Um, just, you know, proof that women have always been at Scripps. Women have always been on board our ships. Um, the upper picture here is two of Carl Hubbs's students, Elizabeth Campa and Eugenie Clark. Uh, this picture was taken in 1946. Um, the woman with the Nansen bottles here at the bottom is Catherine Lafond, who I certainly want to learn more about. Um, I found out in my research that she apparently hid her marriage. It was a worst kept secret at Scripps just so that she could stay employed. Um, and then I don't know, nothing in the archives said anything about who this woman uh, on the right was, but I really like her style of dress and sandals out on deck. That's certainly nothing, nothing I ever could, uh, could get away with. Um, you know, women in the chemistry lab in 1933 and uh, charting data in 1968. Um, brings us back to Laura Hubbs, who's here on the left. And this on the right is Dr. Mary Ritter. She was a physician. She uh, was married to SIO's sort of founder and first director, William Ritter. She also worked for free for the University of California. Um, while they were still at Cal, she, women at Cal were required to get medically cleared in order to use the gym or live on campus. And so Dr. Ritter worked for free to medically clear those female students and sign off on them um, doing that, uh, which men did not have to get such clearance. I, you know, at, at Scripps, we have Hubs Hall and we have Ritter Hall, and we don't call them Carl Hubs Hall and William Ritter Hall, but I still think it's important um, that we acknowledge that Laura Hubs was there and Mary Ritter was there, um, you know, clearing the way for, for those of us uh, at Scripps now. Um, I asked uh, Margaret when we spoke about renaming those buildings, you know, could it officially be Carl and Laura Hubs Hall? And she definitely liked the idea and mentioned also Sally Spies, who hadn't come up in my research. Um, she was the wife of another former director, Fred Spies, um, and also worked really hard to preserve the, the historical sites uh, of early scripts. But apparently there's a rule now where no building can be named or renamed without a donation involved. Um, so instead, she pitched an idea that we could add plaques or displays in Hubs Hall, in Ritter Hall, in Spies Hall about these women who also helped, um, you know, found the university and set it up for, for her success. And that idea still has to be cleared by the Heritage Committee, um, but she took the, the idea to them back in November when we first spoke. Um, we're still waiting to hear an answer, um, and I'm certainly going to keep asking. So I think, you know, even though we're still going to call them Hubs Hall and Ritter Hall and Spies Hall, I, I just I think it's very important. Um, I want to wrap up real quick by just talking about how much more there is to talk about. There's so much more research to do um, and so much more to talk about here at Scripps. I've had you know a wonderful career, met and worked with some amazing people. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, there's more to do, more progress that can be made. Uh, Lynn Talley told me about how she had no mentorship when she started at Scripps. Uh, she had no idea what to ask for when they asked her about a startup package. She requested a light table and a package of pens, um, not knowing that other people were asking for labs full of equipment and $100,000 in funding. Um, she just, you know, didn't know and, and felt grateful to have, have a, the opportunity to join the faculty. Um, I think the programs that have been happening recently, the anti-racism program, um, you know, learning about microaggressions um, and things like that are really important. I hope everybody's participating in those. Um, implicit bias trainings for the faculty hires has been an important 
step in the progress. Kathy Constable, when she was vice chair, told me she sat in on those trains just to make sure to everyone in the room, it was clear that these things were taken seriously by leadership. Um, and while I'm definitely happy to share my personal stories, I never shy away from that. I definitely want to acknowledge that I am white. I am heterosexual. Um, I can't speak to all experiences. Um, and you know we have to respect the intersectionality that affects uh, everyone differently. Um, I'm also a technician, not a graduate student. So I have a different level of exposure and a different level of you know beholden to, to the academic system. Uh, the you know affirmative action statutes, uh, the defeat of Proposition 16 on the ballot last year leaves it so that these diversity initiatives have to be unofficial. Um, you know they they while I believe that they're important to the University of California, while I believe they're important to Scripps Institution of Oceanography and not just the current directors, it does mean that 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 can change, you know, and 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 less less influence um, be put on those. I also, you know, hope that we're not asking too much of people, you know, for the equity advisors and engagement fellows, you know, these are people who have full time academic careers um, at the same time. And so, you know, getting paid or getting credit for this extra effort um, and, and having that be up to sort of advisor discretion is, is something that concerns me, um, as well as transparency and hiring salaries. Lynn Talley mentioned that she found out only years later she had the worst deal of any faculty member at Scripps. Um, but that it was later remedied, but she had to, you know, push back on that. Uh, there was a great paper recently, hopefully everybody saw, about uh, replacing this leaky pipeline analogy with something a little bit more, you know, realistic, holistic. Um, and I think that's something that should really be incorporated wholeheartedly at Scripps. Um, everyone I talked to for this piece, for the article, for my research, and probably every person at Scripps on this call today has stories of women uh, and minorities who didn't make it through the academic gauntlet for one reason or another. And I just, you know, the as with the ocean tides, you know, there's ebbs and flows in all of our memory and institutional memory when it comes comes to these equality initiatives. And there's just so much at stake that, you know, we have to all remain vigilant and ensure that this best science is getting done um, and that the people uh, here are able to dedicate themselves to it. Um, otherwise, history is going to repeat itself. And, and I don't want to see that, you know, every generation thinks it's going to do better than, than the last, but it's important to acknowledge along the way the, the history and, and work forward from there. Um, a little bit about the resources. I this is um, the Scripps History site has some great ones. The digital archive is where I got most of the documents that I used for the article and for this presentation. Um, the second one, the special collections, has thousands of searchable photos. Um, I, like I said, I certainly don't recommend checking it out unless you've got some time because you will fall down some rabbit holes. It's really amazing stuff. Um, and Rob Monroe in the comms office, uh, I'll also re recently put out a book with a bunch of those photos, but bring it all the way up to 2020. Um, and I've made a whole list of other things I want to do, uh, want to read. There's recordings on there. There's dozens of pamphlets about the history of scripts um, and great interviews with female scientists before and after they retired. But making time for that, you know, I have a full time job. Um, it's not it's something I did you know, out of love for scripts and and out of you know wanting an A in my class. But it's it's you know it's a lot of time, and I um, really want to get some of those things updated. They they reorganized this site after I originally put out the article, so the links in that article, many of them don't go anywhere, and I'm going to get that fixed uh, relatively soon. Um, but here's a link to that article if you haven't already checked it out. Um, I want to thank everyone who answered my questions and helped me find the resources, uh, including the Women and Minorities in Science group. Um, and then the Scripps Comms Office for publishing the piece in their online magazine. Uh, as I said, with National Geographic, I think it's really important for Scripps to be the one, you know, talking about these things and starting these conversations. Um, I also read this great book that um, Bruce Applegate in the Ship Ops Department recommended to me um, about seagoing life in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And I think there's a great opportunity for a sequel. Um, so many more stories to tell that could bring it up into the modern day. Um, but again, who's got who's got that kind of time? I would love to put something like that together, though. Um, and 
there's also a, a book, I think, in the history of Scripps, you know, of, of the women at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Um, and I'll certainly continue to pursue that idea. Um, I feel like it's a necessity. Uh, like I said, I do it out of love for Scripps, um, out of loyalty, but also just that little bit of anger that, that this is sort of a, a hidden part of our past um, sort of keeps me going. So thanks everyone for coming today and, and for uh, whims for having me. Um, I think there are the events like this and trainings and discussions. I'm really glad to see all uh, how many people are participating today. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I'd love to hear, you know, discussion from people about ways we can all move forward. So thanks very much. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Um, we had uh, a couple of questions uh, in the chat. Um, someone, oh, someone wanted to know what year uh, that seagoing manual was uh, put out again? That was 1985. Nice. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Um, we have some, uh, someone suggested that for the naming of the buildings, instead of like a name change, could it be a name correction? So it doesn't constitute a donation. It's just a shift yeah. of the names. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I like that idea. And, and someone else I saw pointed out what constitute a donation. And I hadn't thought about it from that. But yeah, maybe we can crowdfund this. And, and what do you need? What do you need for a donation to change it to Carl and Laura Hubs? Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably a question, uh, you know, for Margaret, for the Heritage Committee. They all did seem you know, no one was opposed to the idea uh, and, and opposed to, to the idea of recognizing these women. So, but I like that maybe we can find a, a loophole here and that it's a name correction, not a name change. So <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> um, and then somebody, people were asking how uh, we can be involved in this and help with your research and you know like you said you obviously have a full-time job so this isn't uh more of a passion project at the moment but um people are clearly interested in supporting this and uh helping yeah. work so what do you think um i mean i'm certainly glad to hear that because you know it's been during the pandemic and all of the the chats i had with people were virtual um, it does feel a little bit like I'm, I'm sometimes in an echo chamber of like, isn't this cool? So it's really a great opportunity to share it with a larger group uh, who clearly feel the same way. Uh, I don't really have a great ideas about that. So I, I actually switched from working at Scripps to up to main campus. So I'm still, you know, part of UCSD. I still have, you know, decades worth of time and love invested in Scripps and, and would love to return at some point. But um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good question and one that I'm sort of trying to figure out myself is, is there somewhere to pitch um, a book? Is there more, you know, should we put up blogs uh, for women to share their stories as sort of like a sequel to this um, Tales of a Woman Oceanographer book? You know, what, um, what are those next steps? And, and I'm not 100% sure about that, but I'm glad to see people being excited about it. And if you want to connect with me, you know, on LinkedIn or send me an email or something like that, you know, I'll certainly, certainly keep, could use the help, so. Yeah, that's awesome. I know that some um, other members of WMIS a while back had, uh, we discussed uh, doing an update to like, there's like the woman uh, of SIO uh, booklet that, uh, right. I think it was at the library at some point. I think I only saw it once. I don't know who had the hard copy I saw, but we were like, I think that we should, we should update that. <laughs> it's been yeah. A yeah, I was conflicted about that. So apparently that book, uh, the little pamphlet came out and it's now on the Scripps History site uh, in 1994 when the America's Cup race was in, in San Diego. And I guess it was something where maybe it was the first time that the sailing race also had a female, you know, component to, to the athletes. And so the women at Scripps and the women of the America's Cup race like met for a luncheon or something like that in advance. And so this was this pamphlet put together um, of the women, women of Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and it included, you know, the, a lot of the people I talked about here today, Kathy Constable and Lynn Talley. It also had a section on Sally Ride because she had a partial appointment 
with scripts. Um, and it's kind of weird. It's like, I almost don't like that there's a, you know, a list of women and, you know, there's 20 of them. Look at that. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, you know, <laughs> that's great. And so if we did something like that today, it would be a nice, you know, much thicker book, not a, not a little pamphlet. Um, but yeah, I mean, highlighting these accomplishments and, and, and it didn't just pull out five big names, right? It's not just like, look, we have Sally Ride. It's like, no, here are all of these women that are here, you know, with their labs and doing this really important work. So um, something like that is certainly could certainly be with together. And I like Steve Diggs uh, uh, idea in the comments that, you know, there's a bunch of these scripts timelines. Um, and I would like to put out something like that where, you know, sure, we can talk about Roger Revell. Sure, we can talk about the war. We can talk about all those other things, too. But let's drop in, you know, some of this stuff from the timeline as well. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um... I know that I got uh, an email uh, responding to my notice about this happening, um, that the link to your article and then that SIO booklet, uh, your article was added to the uh, Scripps History UCSD site. Um, right. So seems like seems like there's a lot of people that are interested in seeing this happen and more explored and more out in the open. Um, yeah, yeah. And I don't know exactly um, who, if there is a scripts archivist anymore, maybe that's something I saw the uh, librarian Amy Butchers on uh, earlier. I don't know if she still is, but there's, um, I'm not sure if there's actually a scripts archivist anymore. Um, and yet there, I mean, there's amazing resources on online and it's great that someone digitized all of those. But as far as I know, the two archivists I came across their work are both retired. Uh, and I think that that's a really important part of of this history is just someone who who knows it, who who does it for a job. So hi, Amy. Hi. Uh, yes, just to quickly answer your question, there isn't just a Scripps archivist because Deborah Day retired before the library closed a few years, but the campus special collections and archives takes care of the collecting and curating of the Scripps archives. So for these things that are digitized and for access to them, you can always go to the website, ask them questions or ask me that that'll be excellent. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you. And sorry in advance if you get a whole bunch of new requests uh, after <laughs> this presentation. <laughs> so because yeah, I would really forward them. <laughs> <laughs> good. Thanks. <laughs> Because yeah, I would really love to be part of you know a working group and just just talking about you know what what else can be done. So um, by all means, any ideas are welcome. Yeah, if anybody on the call now has any questions for Melissa or Amy, she's here too. Any of the other staff as well. <laughs> I'm just reading through the comments to see if there was anything else uh, I missed, but yeah. What are, uh, what do you think your like uh, next steps in this like research process would be? Maybe I if you had all of the time. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, that's a good question. No, and I know when we talked earlier in the, so I turned in this, paper for my class in December. Uh, and then I was immediately on a research cruise on the Ravel for a couple of months and was like, oh, I'm going to do all this research. No, yeah, no, that none of that happened. Um, and so I got back from that in March and, you know, we got the, the article edited and, and put up on Explorations Now, which I really appreciate. Um, and then it was like, there's, there's more research I want to do. I want to present to this group. I want to share the research that I did. I want to share that it was hard to do this research. This isn't just something, you know, this isn't a Wikipedia entry. This isn't something I could just pull out of a quick Google search. This, you know, takes hours to scroll through and, and check and, and interview people and, and all of those sorts of things. And so it's, it took time, right? This is why we, this is five months later after I was like, oh, we should do a talk. Um, because I had to make sure I had time. Um, so next up, I mean, ideally, yeah, I would find a way, there would be a way to get funding, you know, pay me for a year of my time and I will write both of these books. You know, I'll write the, the past book that tells us all about Scripps history in a much more inclusive way than I think it's ever been done before. 
and then also uh, you know something a collection going forward in time um from from the book that was more of like the cold war era oceanography that's a really great read and has amazing insights um but you know all of us most of us on this call started our careers after that ended and so you know I, history didn't end in the 80s and the 90s you know discrimination didn't end in the 80s and the 90s um you know just because it's better now doesn't mean there's not things we need to address and deal with yeah i really um liked your comment about how you've been talking to margaret um who's not on the call today but she had something come up but um because i i've always noticed around like all of the plaques and descriptions of like you know various research and history that's gone on always missing uh women and people of color but of course right yeah I, they were there <laughs> they were there yeah they were there i think it would be so nice to have that sort of like update just around campus you know things that like i mean pamphlets and articles and blog posts are awesome and a way to get spread the word to everybody but you know for you know scripts is going to be around has been around for a while hopefully <laughs> will be around yeah. for much longer so you know sort of having that history like immortalized i think is yeah no i think that's a really good point and it is something that because i wasn't a graduate student at scripps maybe i don't think about it initially but yeah i would want every graduate student who came to scripps to know that they you know weren't necessarily the first you know i don't know to me that's comforting right to not feel like you're the first you have to be a trailblazer no you know there, there were these women there were uh, people of color there, you know, and so to have that, yeah, buildings named after it or plaques that you see when you're on campus or, you know, part of the orientation materials or just it being wider known on, on Scripps campus, you know, it's an easy thing to do to, um, you know, put blinders on and not know the history, but I would love to, to find a way that, that that was really incorporated more into day to day life at Scripps. Yeah, I'll just, I mean, I'll just say too, the orientation stuff, like adding some of that history in there, I think would be great because they love to spout like, you know, 1907, length of the pier, like really awesome facts. But, <laughs> and and I feel like, especially, I'm, I'm a, uh, I think I'm starting my fifth year now, so I haven't been here that long, but um, each year they always update us on the size of the incoming class and the number of women and people of color in the classes, but so they always make it such a big deal, but you just, you know, especially after hearing your talk, you just realize that it's, there's a hidden history that you're just ignoring and denying. And it would, you know, it's nice to be, um, this class that I'm in is 50% women, that's great, but it would be nice to also think about, you know, the people that came before you. So right. yeah, I think updating that, I don't know who, we could talk yeah. about that or who on the call would be interested in yeah no and i do want to say margaret couldn't wasn't isn't here because i i picked the time and it conflicted with her schedule she was very encouraging of the topic of the conversation i believe if she were here she'd be answering questions and and giving us input so um I, you know i think there's the a, a vast potential for that and i think it was steve Diggs again who mentioned you know forming some sort of history task group i think that's the right idea is is I mean not to give you know women and people of color more things to do that they don't get class credit uh, or money for, but you know I, this is an important thing, and so I'd like to see you know a mix of professors and staff members and graduate students you know prioritize this and and how that goes about I don't have experience with, but I would love to to see it happen and participate um, if if possible. So. Uh, Steve Diggs just asked a question in, oh, okay. in the chat. Oh, look at that. All right. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Um, <laughs> the question is, can I expand on the topic of conflating gender and ethnic diversity, uh, some of the synergies as well as some of the dangers? Uh, I don't know if you, yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's certainly, Certainly something I want to make sure I'm sensitive to, you know, as a white woman is that not all of this is, you know, my history and not all of it is going to affect me the same. Um, there's, I don't know how to get rid of this little green 
thing. I don't know. All right. Anyway. Um, but yeah, so the, the statistics on that are again something that's pretty hard to come by. You know, there's this one slide I showed about the graduate students where ethnicity was an option to include um, as well uh, in your statistics, um, as well as uh, yeah, gender identity and um, sexual orientation. Um, you know, and so visualizing this in this way, it wasn't really done, in my opinion, you know, can be done better on these diversity dashboards. Um, you know, I, because it's the women and minorities in science group, I, you know, I want to make sure I acknowledge that, you know, it's not just women's history, it's, it's, you know, underrepresented minorities of all, of all sorts at Scripps. Um, and, you know, I had to, at some point for my, my article, pick one sort of topic to zero in on because otherwise it you know doubles and triples in length and and the research time and all of those sorts of things um you know i i like the idea of it sort of being all together we talk about women we talk about people of color we talk about um you know uh, sexual orientation and we talk about trans history at scripts which is something i didn't find you know pretty much anywhere in any of this research but i'm sure it's there um and and you know also that going forward in terms of are those separate statistics or are those you know uh or do we leave those sort of um binary and i'm just glad to see that there's more of that now so um if you have more specifics that you want to talk about steve maybe you can speak up because i don't want to just ramble on but um it is something that i feel like if we separate out i don't know that that is a i i, I feel like that could potentially be a disservice um to to each group um, but I don't know. I'm certainly not the authority on that. I was just going to say that there, you know, traditionally is limited bandwidth, which is why the two topics, and you mentioned, uh, you know, trans, there may be physical disabilities that are also under the topic of diversity, but because there's limited resources and bandwidth and personnel, um, they get grouped together and there are some synergies, but there are some dangers that uh, because you solve maybe one of the problems or make progress in one of the areas, it's touted as an overall success and people tend to back away from it and, you know, quote unquote, go on, go back to their normal lives um, right. once things are, have calmed down a bit. So, you know, it, it, <clears throat> it cut, certainly cuts both ways. You can understand why uh, these things are put together. Um, but then that means that everything that's not that is quote unquote normal. And that is a problem in and of itself. Right. No, that's a really good point. And I certainly don't want to take up all the air in the room just talking about what were, as you saw from the presentation, mostly the white women that I came across in the research. Um, and then, yeah, so I want to be very uh, aware of that. And I hadn't really considered um, what you say about, you know, whatever the potential fatigue of people hearing about it. It's like, oh, we talked about women's history. Why do we now have to talk about, you know, um, Black history at Scripps? Uh, and I certainly don't want that uh, to, to not be accounted for. So th thoughts on that, more input on that. Um, and I like your idea of, you know, it's a, it's, we're talking about history here, not, it doesn't have to be women's history. It doesn't have to be underrepresented minority history, just actual history of Scripps. Um, and just making sure we talk about all of it instead of the stuff that rose to the surface, you know, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, et cetera. Right, exactly. Conversations that need to continue. So thanks to uh, the Women and Minority in Science group for, for doing that, for providing the space for that. And um, I hope that all of your, attend uh, your meetings are well attended and these conversations are happening. As uh, Steve said, the conversation continues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, feel free. I put my email in the chat. I'm certainly happy to to be involved in, in any you know things going 